Hey everybody, welcome back. So a sanctioned Russian oligarch with direct ties to Putin, Oleg Deripaska, had his homes in DC and New York raided by the FBI this week and an investigation stemming from either the Southern District or Eastern District of New York. And here to discuss the ins and outs is my favorite Russian spy hunter, author of the book, Compromised. <laughs> please, please welcome Peter Strzok. Hi, Peter. Hey, how are you? Good, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, you too. Uh, first. First things first here, I mean, out of the blue, seemingly, um, we have these raids on Deripaska's, well, he owns them. I don't know if he lives there, but they're his residences. Can you just give us your top line thoughts on how this is, you know, we hadn't heard anything leading up to this uh, and and what your takeaways are from, from this raid, these raids, I should say? Um, so it was surprising, and I think based on Deripaska kind of having a little mini meltdown on his Telegram channel overnight, that it was a surprise to him as well. He was, you know, kind of complaining about everything and took a shot at the end that hopefully the, you know, the agents, you know, found stale jam and some bottles of vodka and their Bolshevik bean counting ways and looking for, you know, money bags from Putin. So he was, he was clearly both uh, not pleased and surprised. But I think all of us, the question is, you know, so what for an FBI agent to be in a place, they either have to have the consent of the person who has control over it, or they need a warrant, and either a criminal warrant or FISA warrant. Typically, FISA warrants are not done overtly like this was, so that tells me that there was some sort of a court order, um, probably a search warrant, um, that gave them lawful authority to be there. And you know, the most likely reason is that there is an ongoing investigation that there was a, you know, an agent who could sit down and swear out an affidavit saying that there was probable cause to believe that there was evidence of crime in those residences, you know, and that can be typically fruits or instrumentalities, right? Something that was used to do the crime, something that is evidence, you know, bank records, phone records, legal documents, something that would show computer, you know, hard drive, something that would show the commission or evidence of the commission of a crime. And then there's also kind of a component too, like he was he was sanctioned, put on the sanction list by Treasury in 2018. So, you know, there are forfeiture provisions that come. So it might be, and one of the thoughts I had is, you know, it is possible as part of these sanctions that the U.S. government could go looking to attach to his assets to forfeit them and essentially take control of them, you know, sell them, but whatever monetary penalty was owed to the United States and or if these were the result of illegal activity to seize that. So first thought was like, well, maybe they're going in there just to catalog on the fine art. And but as, as the day went on, you know, people in both locations in D.C. and um, New York, the news coverage had, you know, just videos and photographs of people carrying out boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff in small boxes, not like, you know, marble statues or big paintings, but things that make you believe that it would be whatever those items are, um, something that would be consistent with evidence of a crime. I think there was something showing a, a car being towed away from DC, but, you know, whether that was I, because that might have evidence or, or trace, you know, sort of, you know, fingerprints, hair, fiber type stuff, or if it was just seeking to, you know, seize the vehicle to forfeit, I don't know. But the high level takeaway is I think it surprised everybody. Mm. I think the immediate memory that comes to everybody is that the business relationship between Manafort and Deripaska and the fact that, you know, allegedly Deripaska had loaned him up and around $10 million as part of trying to settle that debt that Manafort was offering private briefings about the Trump campaign to Deripaska that he provided, you know, the now infamous, you know, confidential campaign polling data that he gave to Constant Klimnik, which now the Senate at least is calling an intelligence officer, Russian intelligence officer, not just an agent, but, you know, that kind of closest point of contact that at least we've seen publicly between elements of the Trump campaign and the Russian intelligence services. But Manafort gave that polling data to Klimnik, asking Klimnik to give it to um, Deripaska. So, there is, I think everybody, when you hear Deripaska, the thought is, okay, is there something relating to this? I think Andrew Weissman in his book talked about the, the possibility of being very close to being able to charge Manafort with regard to some conspiracy in the context of his relationship with Deripaska. Um, so DOJ cleared him to say that in the book. Uh, but it could, it may be that, it also may not be. It may be, you know, Deripaska is, a, you know, allegedly has been involved in part of the things he was sanctioned for. We're engaging in a variety of not just unsavory, but illegal business dealings. So this might be 
the result of other investigations of other criminal activity and you know what that might be anybody's guess so we shall see i think well, um, a great minds, Pete, because you just flew through every single question that I had for the entire <laughs> interview. So I think we're done. No, um, I want to I want to unpack some of that stuff, though. Um, and I want to talk about, first of all, the the criminal investigation versus counterintelligence investigation. Uh, I, did I hear you correctly? Are you saying that simply being sanctioned means that you might have to uh, forfeit forfeit assets? I I, I don't I don't know enough about how Treasury designations convey the ability to seize or attach things, tangible goods or money in accounts. So I think and, and in other words, I don't know, there could be at least and I'm, I'm way out over my skis here. One could be if you owe some sort of judgment where you are in default for a court has found that you're liable for paying some amount of money and the government can go look at some point to seize um, assets to fulfill that obligation. The other thing would be slightly different that if you are, you know, laundering money or if you're buying things that, you know, that are a, the fruit of illegal activity that you can attach to that through forfeiture. And those are slightly different things, but the ins and outs of how that works with treasury designations, I just, I don't know enough to, to be able to speculate on that. Um, so, and again, to the point of what what folks were after in there, um, they're in there a long time. I mean, the the I think it was you know whatever time it popped up when some reporter was running by or walking by his DC residence, and I think they were there at least late until the late afternoon, early evening. So easily you know 10, 12 hours inside. This was not you know I'm looking for a thumb drive, go in there and you know dig through. There was a lot of material taken out, so the scope of the warrant appears to be fairly broad um and you know again we're, we're guessing it's out of new york not dc so you know there's some spec I, I i have seen people speculate and i don't think it is related to the lev parnas igor fruman cases or rudy's investigation i it might be um but i don't know and it is interesting too though that it is out of New York and not DC, um, because some of those logical, you need some sort of venue for whatever you're investigating when in the criminal sense. So if it were something related to, you know, 2016, of course, passing that polling data took place at the Grand Havana room, which was in New York City and wasn't in DC. So, I mean, I can, I can envision a number of reasons it would be in New York um, and none of them sort of narrow down what this might actually be at the end of the day. Yeah, actually, my first thought was it might be related to Tom Barrick and, and that investigation and indictment. I know he had a lot of uh, ties to QIA, Cutter, 666 Fifth Avenue, UAE, but also, um, you know, working with the inaugural committee. And, you know, then you can drag Jolo into this and 1MDB. And because one of the first things I thought of when they were saying they were dragging art out of there is was uh, my first thought was money laundering red flag. Um, but again, yeah, it could be asset forfeiture or seizure, not forfeiture, seizure. Um, it, it's, I mean, but, it, you know, until we know, it's just all speculation. But, you know, also, you know, you brought up Weissman, which I thought was interesting because I was going to talk specifically about that, how he said in his book, Where, Where Law Ends, that they did have enough to, to get Manafort on uh, conspiracy against the United States. They went with the tax stuff because it was just much far easier to prove. They got a conviction. Um, they got it, the sentencing they thought they were going to get maybe a little on the low end. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, the only reason he's not in jail is because he was pardoned. Um, but he was not pardoned uh, for that polling data thing. But, however, in order to get this warrant, they would have to have fresh evidence. Uh, but I don't think that that would preclude it from being tied into an entire scheme. Yeah, and freshness is a big question in my mind. I mean, in other words, you've got to be able to demonstrate to the judge, you know, why you think there's something that is relevant, that is evidence that's there now. And if you look at, you know, some of the neighbors, I think George Conway actually lives in Kellyanne, lived very close, if not immediately adjacent to the house. He told somebody in some newspaper reporting, and I've never seen the lights on there at night. And from what Deripaska, he, I don't think since is sanctioned in, in 2018, that he's lawfully allowed to come into the United States. So the question is, okay, what if, if people, if he hasn't been in there and if people aren't 
transiting through there or living there, you know, over the course of three years, what does the government have that they're able to say in an affidavit? You know, there's probable cause to think evidence of a crime exists there now. If nobody's really been in there for three years, how do you, it, it, it's, it, it's certainly possible, but that puts a, that, that certainly puts a spin on the, on the, on the possibilities of what that probable cause is, because it's not, you know, it's not going to be a crime that, you know, unless he's got a server that's being operated out of the residence now, but if he did something illegal in February of 2021, and he hasn't been in the United States for three years, there's not really, in most scenarios, a reason to think that recent evidence of a crime would be in that residence. Reasonably, it would go back to something that occurred likely, not necessarily, but possibly 2018 or before, whenever the last time he legally could come into the United States. So it, in my mind, points to at least the likely date of whatever this crime or investigation is, some element of it, some element of the criminal activity taking place back whenever it was that Deripaska was last in or able to travel to the United States. Now, I mean, <laughs> the danger in prognosticating like this, are there, you know, a thousand ways that that theory might fall apart? You know, if he has an assistant that constantly, you know, takes care of the house and he's still getting bank statements there and they're bringing in the mail, well, that could be, I, they're just, while that scenario laid out seems to me likely, it is by no means certain. So there's always a danger when we start speculating like this. Yeah, I know, but danger is fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you're right. I, I hadn't thought of that before. It, he, he hasn't been there in a really long time. It's not like the raid on Rudy Giuliani where they had to do it quickly because he's there every day or every other day or, or, or whatever, or there's people there. It's an active, there's activity. Um, and yeah, so I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that uh, possibility before, but I, I, I'm pretty sure the Inspector General of Department of Justice is investigating whether or not a lot of these cases were kind of quashed or held back or purposefully blocked by Bill Barr. Uh, we'll, I don't know when we'll see. It's been more than 90 days I, since they started that investigation. I don't know when we'll see the, the fruits of that. We might not if there is an ongoing investigation. They, they tend to keep those reports under wraps. Um, you know, same inspector general has been looking at January 6th and January 5th since January. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah that's and those can take, I mean, I know just from my own experience, I mean, those things can take years. So I wouldn't, you know, the fact that we're, you know, six, seven months in, it might be another 12 months before anything comes out or more. And wait, you have personal experience with inspector. General shockingly enough. Yeah. They, they tend to keep them quiet unless they want to like, you know, illegally release, uh, expedient private text messages in the in the middle of the night to reporters but that's neither here nor there so yeah yeah um, no, so you're... point being i think we'll, we're going to be waiting a while before we see several of these ig investigations and then the other point to the ig is that you know they do have a lot of authority over the fbi in terms of what they can compel and ask and get information wise but when it comes to the doj attorneys their authority is significantly reduced. A lot of that falls within DOJ's OPR, which is nothing like the IG. So when it comes to the IG looking at the actions of the department versus the FBI, it's not, it, it may not, the result may not look like what people are accustomed to seeing when they see reports about the FBI or DEA or subordinate com investigative components of the department. Yeah. And, and you brought up the automobile. I think that that's interesting. Uh, I've heard one or two automobiles were taken. And again, it could be seizure, but also, I mean, you know, how long have this car has been sitting there? Uh, could they have evidence in them? You know, if somebody plugs your phone and the phone into the car, I mean, like who, who knows what it is, but I think that it's very telling that there were actually not just in there taking, you know, fancy expensive stuff. There were seemingly boxes of documents and yeah. Uh, did they you mentioned art i was i was did did you see that or did people report on that i mean i was kind of throwing that out as a hypothetical but i didn't <laughs> see actual art being dragged out yeah i know people who were like kind of on the ground on the scene like uh, rubberneckers etc had, had seen what appeared to be like a, a piece of art with a blanket over okay. it uh well, so speculation but art size yeah, if, if that's i mean if that's true if it is art i mean that that certainly does point to forfeiture type um activity i mean now it could be 
any number of things. It could be evidence of a crime and things that might represent, you know, things that the government would want to attach to as the sort of the proceeds of, of ill-gotten gains. Um, but if, if there was art being taken out, that points to it's not just, you know, looking for evidence of the crime. It's looking for the, 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 the fruits of the crime and how that might be have been converted via money laundering or something else. But that's interesting. Yeah, and that's the reason I brought up Jolo. I remember, I think Leonardo DiCaprio had to return a Picasso and a Basquiat purchased with uh, laundered money uh, from that was put into the Wolf of Wall Street, oddly. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of where my my brain was going with with that. And I, re I remember that investigation and I remember how many people, Broidy, uh, somebody from the Fugees, how many people were swept up in that 1MDB um, yep. investigation. And, oh, you know, we got that indictment for illegally donating money uh, to to campaigns uh, funneling it uh, from from one MDB um, and I know that uh, Donald pardoned Broidy uh, for mm -hmm. his involvement in that so it's just it's very um, I mean there's so many you know I mean you you worked on this there's just so many threads and you know part of me wonders if the Deripaska raid isn't didn't originate um, in the Mueller investigation much like I think the Tom Barrick thing did or if it's just it could you know like i said it could be just purely a sanctions uh thing a sanctions violation sanctions thing and but i mean ten and a half hours like you said it doesn't feel like a like a sanctions raid yeah and the other i mean you know and is i mean he is an oligarch his business interests and is are broad and complex and so you know we are focused on his relationship to manafort in 2016 but you know you think about like the the Russell, the, you know, the Russian aluminum plant that they had agreed to build in Kentucky, you know, shockingly enough, Sinners McConnell yeah, I, and I, Rand Paul, I tagged proud, Mitch, proud, I tagged um, Mitch and Paul you know, and Rand Paul supporters yesterday. of that. And my understanding is that, you know, I don't know that a, the first shovel has been put into the ground after all that, but, you know, when that was going through, I think that was part of the reason that, you know, through, I don't know if it was CFIUS or another process that Deripaska had to, uh, get rid of a majority uh, ownership stake um, or reduce his ownership stake so that the plant could the plan could go forward. And so that was approved. And I don't know, again, I would be very curious if it's actually resulted in a single additional job for a Kentuckian. But setting that aside, you know, is there something there? Is it the point being that for every one thing like that, if you're Oleg Deripaska and you have extraordinary control over the aluminum production of Russia, you are going to have any number of activities which might run afoul of the law. So it, speculating is is really just that at this point. But I'll expect one well, soon enough. I mean, look, if you're the FBI, you know when you do these a search like this, let alone two, that it's going to hit the news. And so whatever you have to do before it becomes public, you're going to have done. You know, if it's if it's important, you're going to say, all right, you know, w before you take a step that's going to be very alerting and very public like that, anything you need to do in terms of obtaining information at a minimum, like freezing and preserving iCloud accounts or, you know, communications records or anything that might be deleted or deletable, you're going to either get it or maintain it such that when you do something like this, you know, presumably when, you know, Deripaska and his undoubtedly extraordinarily competent attorneys go out to try and control what might be out there if you're the FBI or DOJ, you've already gotten it or you've already caused it to be copied, sequestered until such a time as you can get a warrant to go get it. So this overt step like this indicates a certain um, maturity of the investigation. And again, it's not like he's not going there. You're not worried that he's going to go in tomorrow and actually there's evidence there that he's going to destroy overnight. So you can pick. I mean, they could have done this a month ago, a week ago, a month from now. There's not a sort of exigent reason to have to go in yesterday. So that tells me that at least a lot of the work that they would have wanted to do, if you have the liberty and luxury of picking the time that you're going to search, then you do it once you've accomplished everything that else that you reasonably want to do. So yeah, the I think we'll see. The urgency uh, wasn't there. Yeah, that's, right. sometimes it is. Uh, but yeah, we will see. I think one thing we can agree on though is is how uh, the 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 good news here, I mean, there's a lot of good news for me personally, but the good news here is that we didn't hear a peep about it from the Department of Justice before it went down, much like we didn't have any idea that Tom Barrick was going to be indicted and we didn't have any idea that Rudy was going to be raided. 
Uh, and so I think that uh, we've, we're back into an era where the Department of Justice is uh, keeping tight-lipped about things, not announcing investigations, uh, and, and, and doing things as, as they're supposed to do them uh, until, like you said, such a time when there's going to be an overt thing that people are going to know about, uh, and they're prepared for, it, for that moment when it arrives. Yeah, and you can go. What will be interesting to do is if the government comes up with enough information to charge Deripaska to pull out whatever that, you know, the complaint and the indictment, whatever it ends up being, and take a look at the narrative. And you can see with Barrick, and, you know, the question is, are there gaps in the narrative, right? Where where people, you know, political actors like Bill Barr or others come in and say, okay, you know, never mind the little established blackout around the election, but we're going to extend that for, you know, six months earlier and months after just to get him out of office. Is there, if and when charges against Deripaska come, is there going to be that similar gap that would point to kind of the, the shenanigans, the politicization of the of the department that occurred in the last administration? Is this just going to present another data point? Um, but you're right. It, it, it didn't leak. Barrick didn't leak. Clearly, investigators in the FBI, investigators in New York and D.C. were well aware of this. And, you know, the first we all hear about is when we're watching our televisions with, you know, folks in raid jackets, you know, walking into the residence. So it's a good, as a, as a former FBI person, that's exactly what you want. That is how it should be. That's appropriate. And now we can all wait and see what comes. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I, I like your idea that it's it's a more mature investigation because they didn't have that kind of urgency where that, you know, with Cohen or uh, et cetera, where they had to go in immediately to preserve the evidence, uh, you know, in, in the face of it potentially being destroyed. So, yep, we'll keep our eye on it. And I uh, appreciate your time today. Everybody pick up the book Compromised. Really, really good book. Uh, still reading about ghost stories uh, is <laughs> one of my favorite things. So or, you know, watch the Americans, whatever you need to do. Uh, but I appreciate your time today. Pete Struck. Great. Thanks. M S W Media.